ko haiti ki te maunga, ko karanga hape te marae, ko te tō ai te awa, ko te whānau pani rawa, ko uh, Ngāti toro tōku hapū, uh, ko Ngāpui nui tonu rawa, ko Ngāti kahu tōku iwi, ko mā tātua te waka, ko whangaroa te mōna. Uh, ko Matangiro te kainga, um, ko Nairipora taku ingoa. Uh, at the moment we are sitting here in Matangiro, this is my home um, and a very special place for me where my tūpuna uh, before me sat, fought for, um, cried over, uh, still fight for, <laughs> still fight over. Um, this is our papa kainga, this is our tūranga waiwai. And uh, we sit in the centre of Whangaroa Harbour. I'm a big time anti, um, anti 1080 person, as, as we all may know, and it's because of the simple fact for me, um, it's a poison, it's a toxin, it's one of the most deadliest toxins that are on this planet. And I believe that no toxin should be spread. Um, so freely as the government does um, over our whenua at all. Uh, being that any toxin that is laid, no matter how they say it's supposed to um, help our wildlife, our ngahere, um, the future that that has for my tamariki and their children is no future. They will depend on a um, exporting uh, country to feed them, um, to house them, to clothe them, uh, because they can no longer go in and hunt for their food, um, gather any natural resources whatsoever, because it will be contaminated. Um, TNAD is one toxin, there's brodificum, there's sprays that they use for gorse, for weeds, for um, everything really that they try and stop um, nature from being nature. Um, you look around me, I've got probably every obnoxious weed that you could think of, but I'm okay with that. You never know, 20 years from now, that devil weed or that lantana could be a actual medicinal plant, but because they look at it as a weed, they don't really look at it to do something else. It is being brought in from overseas, but I believe that they haven't done enough work to see how we can make this into something that's a resource. Doesn't matter what it is, whether it be a possum, whether it be a plant. Gorse, for instance, you know, it's great for our phenomena. It brings life back to our soil, um, our microorganisms, and once the bigger trees grow over the top of it, it dies because it needs sun. It needs a lot of sun, and we don't have a problem with that. We've um, we used to slash this entire lot of whenua for our family, and um, the the council stopped paying half, so my dad couldn't afford it at the time to um, put these on his tractor or to spray it at that time. So we just left it, and as you can see, this bugger all gorse but there's heaps of manuka you know so the world evolves and from where we're sitting on both sides of the river um, I believe that nature should take its own path man should never pay God mm -hmm. so the 1080 aerial drop was done down in the harbour in the Wairako area which is what they say is dock managed land um, and then our actual land is Ranfilly Bay, but at that time that wasn't given back to us then, so they did the whole lot. And they also did um, a very difficult operation on our island, which is Stevenson's Island. The impact that it had, you know, my nan used to go into up the Wairako stream, um, we used to get off the dinghy and she'd go in and she'd pick um, her kawakawa, her um, tupakahi, her uh, kumaraho would go in there and collect her Māori Roma at the certain times that she needs to collect them when they're flowering or when they're at a certain phase of their cycle. 
in the movements of the moon. And um, she, we always used to get, I remember being little and we, we always used to get greeted by um, the uh, kereru, the, the wood pigeon, and um, we went in there and heard nothing but dead silence. And then we walked up the track, which is on the left hand side of the river when you go up there, and um, we stumbled upon at that time they were actually using carrots and and there was jam and all that kind of stuff all over the place it wasn't very well thought out it was we're gonna kill them because that's what they did i suppose um and then not that far down my nan knocked into one of the kiriru that used to sort of greet us every time we went there and she just broke, she just bawled, and I still remember hearing that cry. Yeah, and so I had to put my name back in the dinghy and bring her back here. You know, we didn't have a motor, so we rode all the way up there, and um, it's far, <laughs> it's very far. And we rode back, and um, my name says to me, "What, what has happened?" And I was only a little girl. I says. I don't know, Nan. Somebody's killing the birds. And she goes, for her, she goes, all I could smell was death. And that, that moment there will always be in my mind. You know, always. And she has never stepped foot on that place ever again to the state. Mm -hmm. And that was simply from them doing something like that. We didn't even know it was happening, you know, and um, you would think that a queer of the area should know, but they had no respect for us or what we thought or what we did back then. They just did as they pleased and said, no, this is what's right for you. We're going to do it. And, um, yeah, that, that, that stays in my mind. And then they decided that they were going to do an operation with, um, we have a Stevenson's Island Ahu Whenua Trust for Stevenson's Island which we refer to as Redifa so it's the Redifa Ahu Whenua Trust and there are multiple shareholders of that island I was only young at the time and my aunties and uncles decided that they would work hand in hand with the government um, and the Department of Conservation to try and get a hold of all these rats that were just running riot on the island and they were actually affecting the growth of our um, mutton birds, our titi. And so they thought, you know, listening to what well, scientists and, and the Department of Conservation, they should know better. Um, they decided they would take a whole like a chest freezer and it was actually full of bait over they got to the island a rogue wave came and flipped the whole barge over all of the bread of went into the water and so the department of conservation and all my whanau that were out there had to go and gather it all back in um, and then Doc said, no, look, we'll aerial drop it because it's safer. The island's not that big. It's not that big at all. And um, they did. They did that. Yeah. And ever since then, they then put what they call a rahui down on us getting our food. So every year around, so every year around about October, we used to go um, and collect our, our titi every year, religiously. My grandfather did it, my great-grandfather did it, and so did my great-great-grandfather. And so all of the people from Whangaroa would go there, whether on their little dinghies, they ain't even safe, like probably sinking halfway, you know, got a one who's rowing or got, just got an outboard motor that goes like two horse all the way over there. You know, and, and they will collect their titi and 
when they actually finished doing the first operation, I think that was the last operation too on the island, the birds have never come back properly. They're all undersized. Um, they're really little now. Um, we were told that we can't collect from the island for seven years. Um, and with the birds being so small, it was hard for us to say to our 98 year old auntie that we can't bring you a titi because they're not there anymore auntie. And what our people do is they get five mutton bird and that will last them out the whole entire year. But it's a part of their diet. Now the mutton bird eats the feces or the spew of our humpback whales. The importance of the mutton bird in this area was they would migrate to our islands. They still do today but very seldomly and they would stop at really far, they would give birth to their fledglings and then they would fly from out sea all the way through Ōtangaro all the way up through Pukati all the way out towards Matauri and Taco Bay now their droppings had such a high content of potassium in it that our floor of our ngahiri our fauna and flora doesn't get their nutrients anymore. So the impact of toxins has actually collapsed a whole ecosystem from one bird from them doing that. But they fail to talk about this, don't they? But we know it because we're there firsthand thinking, oh, you know, after all these years we've had to follow suit and We've even gone against the grain of tikanga and thought we're doing the right thing by right, revitalizing our whenua and our manu when in all reality what it's done is um, taken away the natural nutrients they're supposed to go into our forest floors. And um, I believe that hence why the activation of Cody dieback has happened. Because we no longer get that anymore, our birds do not fly up there no more. So they say that Cody dieback, you know, it's um, a cell that's been activated. Well, yeah, it's been activated, all right, because we're not, we're no longer getting the nutrients that our soil needs. The microorganisms aren't breaking down how they used to. So I believe that's what's what's happened. And um, yeah, I, I when it comes to toxins, yeah. I've seen what it does in the long run and I know what it does, it takes away life because that's what it's designed to do and um, being pesticides, oh they're the worst they are so bad they're designed to kill pests but it's actually an insecticide so you're going to kill an insect our insects here uh, we have here in Whangaroa we have um, certain insect certain plants that are endemic to whangaroa and only grow here and they want to go and do that I don't, I don't understand why you would do that but my theory is is that the only reason they want to drop 1080 or use any type of toxin at a massive scale is number one money we all know that um, and number two I've found that they have been gaining access to prospect um, through dock owned and managed lands so they're coming in the back door using government land crown crown owned land to prospect to get right into our minerals and that's mining it, it all makes sense to me it always has made sense to me keep them out of the bush so they can't see what we're actually doing and, um, and then we'll send in the prospectors, then we'll get the exploration, and then we'll get the mining permit. And um, as of news lately, I knew I was right. I knew I was ex exactly right on the money. The toxicity of mining is, um, it's crazy. Mineralogy International came here recently 
and um, they want to mine for every mineral possible. When they do an operation like mining, they need water. We don't have any water. Then that water goes through all their systems with all their bling and cyanide that they use and it comes down our hour. At the moment, we can't even draw water from our hour as it is and there's no mining because of farming, uh, fertilizers, 60% of our awa here are polluted and can't draw water from it. But our people don't have an option. They have to drink that. Some of them don't care to know, do you know what I mean? They don't care what's happening upstream or they see, oh yep, that looks like it's clean. But in all reality it's not. And when you go to the homes of our whanau that are drinking, are taking, their kids are sick. They're sick. And they, um... They don't understand because to them water is water, we've always had clean water. What's the difference now? Well the difference is chemicals, <laughs> toxins and everything else that's going through our whenua. It's, it's, it's not good. How, how do we try and say to, to people what you're doing with chemicals is not the answer and then they turn around and say to you well, what else do we do? You know, especially, and I don't mean to attack the farmers because they've become a culture here. And I understand that they want to try and farm a better way. Um, but farming is dependent on currency, isn't it? And it goes up and down with what the markets are doing. Uh, whether it be beef or dairy, um, it's the nature of the game and humans have turned to meat and dairy because it's become an economical value to the country when in all reality we don't need it but to get them over that line is, um, is a whole nother story how do we help our farmers become more environmentally friendly um, whether it be riparian zones whether it's replacing the sprays and fertilizers with natural natural things is, is what I'd love to see happen. Um, I think the beef would be a lot cleaner um, and everything else would be cleaner to be quite honest right. but I think they need to put a lot more research into organic uh, products for our taiao. Um, we all know hot water kills the, kills the weed, we all know that but yet it costs them too much money to have hot water. Go figure. We spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars exporting and importing. I don't, I don't understand why. It's, I don't understand why they're doing that to our planet. It would be good to bring in um, more of the, you know, traditional indigenous knowledge around holistic systems thinking. Yeah. You know, and the better understanding of the interconnectedness of things. Yeah, absolutely. I think for for Maori, it's not so much adapting. I think it's going back to what we knew. We were taught how to look after this whenua. We've been taught how to do it, when to do it, why we do it. And um, because we've become dependent on uh, European Western science and money, it's taken us, it's taken us away from what we need to remember to practice and um, here we practice maramataka, we, we, we live it, you know, my Christmas is, is around Matariki, it's not on the 25th of December, however it's trying to change that thought back. For me it's rewinding, it's not actually going forward, we need to remember why because when Say for instance me and my hapu, we are out on the water or we're out in the bush. You will never see people so free. We take our shoes off, we don't wear shoes, we connect. We'll sit there, we'll play in the dirt. You know, I'll go and sit anywhere on the ground. People might have a seat. I'll go and sit on the ground. I feel more comfortable there, you know. Um, and I think it's just because feeling the vibrations of the earth 
listening, um, smelling, touching, tasting, all of that is understanding what Papa Tuanuku is doing. And right now she is crying. And she is crying really, really loudly. And the way that our environment is and climate change is happening, we don't know what's going to hit us next. You know, Australia, bushfires. So what happens when you suck all the wairua and modi out of, a, out of the earth and then expect there not to be a fire? You know, our indigenous brothers over there, they can't even live how they used to live because all their water's gone due to mining. It's sad. We're going through a drought now, even though it's raining today. This is, what, the first decent rain we've had in over four months. Our councils, our government, oh, we've got water relief where you can buy water uh, from the council or from private companies that will go and get the water for you. you know, to get a load of water out here is $490 each. You know, like, really? I had a creek that's tidal that I used to be able to go up probably about maybe a K and a half up to my uncle's, take our tank up there, fill it up. I can't do that no more. Because there's no water. The water's actually not coming down. And when we did tests up there about the clean, um, the cleanliness of our water, it's undrinkable. And that's due to all the chemicals that are in our water. Now, in the, in the Treaty of Waitangi, it states very clearly that we, those are our taonga. Those are the things that we protect. Our land, our water sources, those are our resources. We're not allowed to do that. What do we do now? Stop everybody from doing the stuff that they've been doing? Yes, I believe we do. If a virus can stop a world from turning, I'm pretty sure something that's going to help the planet to turn should be at more importance than what, what a virus is. Is there a Y claim to do with um, chemicals and you know, yes, the pollution? Well, there's a Y claim that actually covers uh, Y claim 262 that, clever, that covers um, the state of our environment today, and that's all in it. Um, it's massive. It's, it's a portfolio of its own that has multiple portfolios in it. It's so political, it's not funny. The Minister of Environment thinks they got a hard job. Try and analyse that, because you can't. You can't. The destruction that has happened to our planet um, and to our country uh, since the arrival of, of Europeans um, over this 180 to 250 years that's unheard of. That's really, really unheard of. And that shorter period of time, the the stuff that has happened to our country is unbelievable. They've actually done a whole era in less than a million years. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. I just look at them and go, wow, why would you come to New Zealand? To make it like England. Why don't you just stay in England? <laughs> it makes no sense to me. This is supposed to be like the Garden of Eden, but look at Africa. Yeah. So is that. Do I mean? Do you guys feel comfortable swimming in these waterways? I do. I I do. Actually, when you're hot and you're boiling and you've just mowed a paddock, you'll jump in any water. Um, I'm I'm a little bit more lucky because I'm on the tidal cusp. But over in Tauranga Bay, yep. Um, at the moment, our lagoon is actually polluted. The fish are dead in it. They're floating near dead. Uh, the sandbar has actually gone across the lagoon entryway, and so there's no water flow coming down. And it's just all dead. So it stinks. It's polluted as. I went off my nut when I saw it like that. And... NRC was down there taking samples. I just walked up to him and said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm taking samples. Never mind taking samples. Call NRC, get them to get a digger in here and dig that sandbar out. That's what needs to happen. You don't wait for the fish to die and then do something about it. No, they still haven't done it. 
The last time that happened, we went to go out there with a shovel and dig it out. But this sandbar is pretty big, so I think we're going to need like the army to come in yeah, and actually get rid of that sandbar. A lot of issues that we have here being mana whenua. Some of our whanau agree to use certain things and some don't. And when it comes to a head-on collision, we have to take it. Unfortunately, this is how it works. We've got one hapu member disagreeing with another hapu member, and we bring it into the whare, we go at each other so much that we will wipe each other out. That's how passionate it is. And those are the dynamics in the whare. Like, nothing is, you don't hold nothing back. You go to war, you go to war. But have you noticed the health of people being impacted? Or, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. So, they've become so reliant on pharmaceutical prescription drugs. It's crazy. If I go up to the doctor and I've sprained my toe or I've kicked something, they'll give me gout tablets, which is anti-inflammatory. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I just kicked the corner of my bed and my toe feels broken. Just want to check if it's broken or not. But we don't have x-rays anymore. Um, so they, they've been trained to steer us away from that holistic medical use that we as Māori know we can use um, but because we don't have x-ray vision we can't see if our tenon is broken or not the lifespan of our people has, has really shortened um, our diets are really quite sad but we're waking up to it and, and getting healthier and going back to the whenua to live off it but because we're in such a low economical place where um, money is is of importance to people that have four or five kids, you know, and they live in a one bedroom little place that's um, only just warm and dry. Um, that's the housing situation that Aurunanga is providing uh, warm, safe and dry homes. Um, and, and that's good, you know, that's good that they've started that project out at Taco Bay. However, our diets come next. Well, actually, to be honest, our hening at all, which is our wairua everything, our spirit, spiritually from up here down to our feet, needs to be in check and in balance. But you can't do that when the food you're eating is bought at a supermarket which has been processed and sprayed unless you buy organic and can afford to buy that but our people can't they can't afford to buy that we don't have a place around here that actually we we don't have places anymore like we had Sanford's we had um, the logging and we don't have those big factories anymore around here so everybody is in poverty status but people are bringing money in that are multi-millionaires and buying whenua out on the coastal line but it doesn't really have an impact on our community or our Māori whanau because they're doing whatever they're do doing building their palaces who knows the food they're eating has a massive impact on their health so when they get sick or have diabetes or have heart problems it comes down to what we put in our body and that's the food and the food that they're processing in supermarkets and whatnot today it's all been sprayed the water's the worst so we call it why Māori our aquifers are drying up and what happens when our aquifers dry, dry up is we then create sinkholes in, in our planet it's, it's getting no modi, it's getting no life in it anymore because we're just draining it out. As fast as it's trying to put it back, it's getting sucked out. And being that our water runs through our whenua uh, and picks up all the goods, all the beds, it's picking up way more beds before it actually gets to us. We're gone from a place with pristine, clean, green country <laughs> to Paru polluted, it's sad for us because we're the ones that have depended 
on it, you know, we, we didn't used to have to go and buy a bottle of water. Me and my brothers used to go catch the bus. There used to be a puna that would run out the side of our bank. We'd stop there, have a drink on the way home and carry on. Never got sick in our life. Didn't even know what Jardia was. We didn't even care. Because to us it was clean. But as soon as the spraying started, all of that kind of stuff, that puna's not even there anymore. Doesn't even run. I put a no spray zone up. They came in to spray last time. Um, and then I went off. I went right off. But we can only be in so many places at once. And my outlook on using toxins and, and chemicals. Find another way. That's what we have to do. That's what they should be spending money on doing. Not flying to Mars. So we've always had a big um, hunting culture here in Kaio. We actually hold the biggest um, pig hunting club in, in New Zealand, is right here. Um, the most members, it's always been a pretty hearty culture. Um, our kids get involved in, you know, catching eel, catching possums, catching fish, whatever it may be. It's hunting. And it's to, one, um, get rid of the pest, and two, use it as food. Now, that's how we live daily, you know. If they had a drop 1080 around here, I wouldn't have been the only angry one, I'll tell you that right now. Um, we have whānau that depend on it for tangihanga. Uh, a lot of our whānau come home, and if it's a, an emergency or an accident, they, they don't have $1,200 to butcher a beast. You know what I mean? They can't afford to buy a cow or... So we just go shoot a pig, take it down there, bleed it out, and then prepare it. And that feeds hundreds of people, you know? And then those, they can't afford to actually buy meat. So we go and hunt, we go and fish. We were out there the other day picking puppies. But that for us is fun, like fishing, diving, hunting, that's fun for us. We can't wait to do it because we've become so reliant on going to work 9 to 5, you know, Monday to Friday. They come the weekend, it's playtime, and that's our playtime. Why should that be our playtime? That should be how we're living every single day. They should be waiting for us to get back from hunting and fishing, not us scheduling Monday to Friday to work in their system so that we can keep that wheel turning for what? To carry on destroying our, our planet? Because that's what it's for. It's exactly what it's for. My parents are, are stuck in that way because they were in that era of you're not allowed to speak Māori. Our language was taken off us. If you spoke Māori, they got, they got a hiding. They got the whip. They got the strap. They got the cane. They got it all. Um, so my parents don't speak to your Māori. And then our generation come along, oh, we're introducing our language back into our, our people. So I learnt Māori before I did English, and I didn't understand why my parents didn't understand, well, not understand the language, didn't speak the language. They understood it very clearly, but they didn't speak it because they were never allowed. My papa and them, the way they hunted as to how we hunt today, using technology or guns or whatever it may be, Totally different, man. It's like bow and arrow styles. <laughs> or spears, you know. We still go spearing. It's it's cool to teach our kids that. Yeah. We still go netting. Um, we still use a hinaki to catch eels. We still do all of that kind of stuff. We still collect seedlings how we used to. We still hunt. We still gather. Had that poison been there, we wouldn't be able to do that. And they had a big... That had a big effect on me to actually stand up for our people here because I know how our hunters, not just because they're in a pig hunting club, that's because it's our culture. And our culture is to, if you don't have any kai in your cupboard and you live in Whangaroa and your family is starving, you're lazy. Simple as it gets. You should never starve here. Add that into the mix, that's all gone. Yeah, I would never live off myself.
I had a knot got involved in the hikoi that you and I actually made me aware of what was happening, um, we wouldn't be allowed out there no more. And yeah, I, I uh, would have caused a lot of problems. I would have probably been in jail along with the rest of the Kaio Pig Hunting Club because, um, yeah, it's our culture. That's how we survive. It's not about food, it's not about any of that. It's about teaching our kids when we're out there hunting and fishing, it's teaching them. We're teaching them how to use their natural instincts to smell, touch, recognize. You know what I mean? You can't even take kids into the bush these days, in this day and age and say to them, what's that tree? It's a tree. No. Not our kids. They know what's around them, their surroundings. So I know for a fact that, say we have a blackout tomorrow, say this virus capitalizes the planet, which it's slowly doing. I know if our kids come home, we're gonna be all right. We're gonna survive. Because we know how to use our environment to survive. But I don't, I, I don't know about other people though, because they've become so dependent. We've brought ourselves into this position, and there's only the like-minded people like you, uh, like Joe, like Emil, that are understanding the bigger picture. And um, the bigger picture is the rich get richer. That's that's the biggest picture. Mm. And in the meantime, they're trying to figure out how they can live on another planet. You know what I mean? And go and screw that up too, I suppose. They think that money can buy them a whole new earth. So wrong. They'll get kicked off their planet too. Well, I believe if we get back into the systems that we used to use. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is, you know, bartering with one another, communicating. Mm -hmm. I sat here the other night, there were 35 satellites that came from heaps of directions. Me, me, my husband and my niece were sitting there and my niece goes, oh, shooting star. She goes, oh, there's another shooting star. And I was like, that's not a shooting star, that's satellite, you know, and just watch them. Because we sit out here and talk about the stars with our kids and mm -hmm. connect them to Te Tai Ao. That's our jobs as the aunties and uncles, that's our job. And um, she was like, what's a satellite? And I said, oh, well, they do different things. She goes, they're spying on us, eh? And she's like all but six. And I said, possibly. And she goes, well, why do adults do silly things, auntie, like spy on people, hurt people, use naughty stuff to kill things? Like, they're very in tune with what happens in a political sense. She goes, why don't they just do this? Stop. And I said, oh, I don't know, darling. I, I actually don't know why they just don't stop. She goes, yeah, it's pretty dumb, eh? <laughs> and that's a six-year-old, you know? Like, come on. You had a six-year-old telling you what to do, and yet you still don't listen. Mm -hmm. And it's their future that's affected. I, th I think that's the answer, actually, is just stopping. Because the earth can repair itself. That's, that's what, what the earth does, yeah. yeah. We just need to stop doing what we're doing. You know? Just stop. stop, yeah. Just stop. Yeah. We need to stop. Mm -hmm. Whether it be mining, whether it be spraying, whether it be anything, we just need to stop. Mm -hmm. Because she's screaming at us right now. I know. Mm -hmm. I know when I look back at it and I'm like either up in a chopper or on a plane or whatever and I look down, I'm like, oh, I feel so sad. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And that's how we're all feeling. You know, we feel her in my mind. Because we are so connected with her and I mean we, that it's it's crazy ish, honestly. Some of the things I've witnessed throughout my life of aunties calling upon the gods to, to change a situation and see it happen. Um mm. the, yeah, you start believing after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Seeing it happen right in front of your face. And to be quite honest, like with with this virus that's happening, you know. I'm so glad it's happening, and I know that sounds stink, but I am. Because the only people that are, well, the only things that are really feeling the pinch of this is obviously the people that's sick, but are the big corporations that can't make money. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. 
And it's the only way we're going to stop. Because they're the ones that need to stop. Mm, yeah, that's right. I don't mind if I've got to live off cannons for the rest of my life and walk all gone down. <laughs> yep, that's it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm all good with going back to row my dinghy or my kayak out there to get it. Sweet ass. Mm. I have fish that jump on my bloody front doorstep. So Thank I don't you. really need to go that far. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 I was speaking to a guy that I met um, at this lady's place, and he's um, he's like his family's organic farmers, and mm. he said that he he knew someone who maybe was involved in forestry up at the Pukati Forest, and that there's an illegal toxic dump up there somewhere, and it's leaching out slowly into the Pongaroa Harbour. I don't know if you know anything about that. It's not in the Pukati Forest. No? No. It's down by the Kaya River. Yeah, is that And a, over in Tocha North as hazardous well. Hazardous waste. Tocha North is hazardous waste. Mm. Yeah. Tocha North is hazardous. Is that Because it used to be the milling. Right. It used to be the mill. Mm hmm So, yeah. Um, NRC know about it. Mm. They really haven't done that much about it. So it's just waiting to be cleaned up? Aurinanga brought it. Okay. Um, but because of the state of the environment and the soil there, we don't want it to leach any further. So there's um, the likes of the Whangaroa Harbour, um, Kia Ropu, which is Fiona, and uh, there was quite a few people on that little committee, and um, they went around, they wanted to plant trees to absorb yeah. all the toxins out of the ground. Well, NRC and the Department of Conservation said they can't do that because the leaves will... Oh. I'm like, no it won't. Just let them plant it. But see, I've got no ears, they've got ears. Mm -hmm. I don't... I find it very hard <laughs> to listen to um, government agencies. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Am I supposed to trust them? You know, because everything they've told me my whole life, my father's whole life, my grandfather's whole life has done nothing but collapse my people, you know? Yeah. Colonise them and look at the state we're in today and now they're turning to oh, mara. we need to go to the Māori, the indigenous people to help uh, bring our planet back to how it should be. Mm. No. Yeah, you yeah. need to get away <laughs> and let it do its thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. but but, and then on the other hand, you're like, oh, are we ready? Are we ready to do that? Are we ready to go back to nature? Because that's what we need to do. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm keen. I'm yeah, keen. Yeah. yeah, I have a feeling it's going to be an enforced thing that's going to happen and no one's going to have any choice about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's coming. Uh, yeah. Work is, is like, so when you're in a processing plant, like for instance, um, you know, I've got mates there that actually work in the treatment plant. Now, they've got all these safety precautions um, and machinery that actually give them the levels and calculations of... Mm -hmm. So they're not fully handling the chemicals. Yeah, yeah, but However, still you still breathe them, you, still do. you know? And, and it really concerns me. My, my brother and his children uh, live in... And they're right there on the flats before you get to the station on the left hand side yeah. across from yeah. And at the back of them someone's just bought his father in law's section down the back and that's running onto that orchard. Mm. I said to my brother, please sell your land. Please sell it and get away from there. Because you are at a high risk of exposing your children. That's right, yeah two different types of cancers. That's right, yeah. I've heard that road in particular. Yeah. A lot of people have died who have lived yeah. on that road and <laughs> nursery as well. I've, yeah. She <laughs> was going to join us and she has some contacts <laughs> nursery and basically over the years front of this large family there's only one person left. No. And so and it's been disease, you know, and premature premature cancer and yeah, so it's it's there, and a lot of people seem to know about it, but the data's not there yet, and... The cancer rate on Māori is huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's massive. And it's not even because they smoke. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of the, like, my auntie Marta, she just passed away. She had a tumour and she died probably about maybe a month and a half ago. I'm not saying that she was the healthiest person because she wasn't. Mm -hmm. But once again, it comes down to what she was putting into her body and there was food. Yeah. Um, but she had a, yeah, she had a tumour and they live in one of the spaces where they draw their water out of Kupagia River. And there's heaps of farmers up Patunga, you know. And mm -hmm. I just am like, what do we do? Mm -hmm. What do we do? It's, for us, it's Māori, it's always political. It always has to be political and I hate it. Yeah. Now, why do I have to go to a government and explain myself on what they're doing? We're the creditors. They're the debtors. Shouldn't it be the other way around? When you read the mm -hmm. Treaty of Waitangi, mm -hmm. you see that very clearly. Mm -hmm. Then you read the Tiriti of Waitangi and you're like, what the heck's going mm -hmm. on here? Uh, yeah, so it's... So what I find very important is Te Waka Putanga mm -hmm. and Te Waka Meninga. That puts everything back into perspective. For us it's mana atua, mana whenua, mana tangata. If we have them in that order, we will always be led in the right direction because if it's going to affect our atua, our whenua or our people in that order, we shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's developing that, redeveloping that understanding. I mean, you guys already have it, and I, I think for from a Western perspective, it's way back, yeah. way back. But it's there, it's there. It there. You know, we all have the same fuck papa at the end of the day. Absolutely, you know, we absolutely. Start connecting with all of it and understanding you know, how it's all connected.